through the research on the biology of this disease, we've come up with some very interesting new therapies that really target the biology and attack the leukemia and its distinctive features that separate it from normal cells. This has been a sea change. It's so different than standard chemotherapy, which typically will inhibit or kill rapidly dividing cells. And we know in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, that it's a very social animal, that it requires interactions with its friends in the so-called microenvironment. And from the microenvironment, it can gain sustenance and also derive signals that can help it proliferate and grow. We also know that it's a disease that's evolved from B cells, which are like grist for the mill. We make over 100 million new B cells a day, and most of them are destroyed within a few days. And why is that? Because the B cells are the cells that make antibodies. So when you're immunized against COVID-19, you have to make new proteins. And what they do is they rearrange our DNA and they make antibodies, which are the rearrangements of genes that we inherit from a mother and father. But on top of that, they actually were able to uh, cause mutations within those genes. And that uh, helps to um, provide a tremendous repertoire that you can select from. Every B cell has, of course, one type of antibody, and that antibody is selected, and the survival of the fittest goes on. So many B cells that we make every day die by the wayside. Well, B cell malignancies, and CLL in particular, is a cancer from these types of cells. And so there's a very important relationship between the survival of the cell and the B cell receptor, or the antibody that it has to make ordinarily an immune response. In addition, there are proteins that really govern the fate of the B cell, namely whether the cell lives or dies. And this is on a razor's edge because in CLL, we have proteins that would kill the cell. They're counterbalanced by proteins that prevent those proteins from killing the cell. And that's the BCL2 family member protein. So this is a, a cell on the razor's edge. Not only has to gain sustenance by the antibody that it uses, but also has this uh, complex, which allows the cell to uh, be on a tightrope, if you will. If you tip it into uh, one way or the other, you can result in destruction of the cell. So we have new drugs that target these key pathways, and including the uh, inhibitors of Bruton's tyrosine kinase, BTK inhibitors. And the uh, first one, of course, was ibrutinib. And now we have what I call the BTK wars, where a lot of new drugs are coming out that are very similar to ibrutinib in inhibiting the enzyme BTK. Uh, most of these are uh, be able to bind to the BTK enzyme, and they form a chemical bond. And that is uh, allowing for the BTK to be inhibited throughout its lifespan, you have to make more BTK for the B cell to be able to gain advantage of that molecule. And I think that what oftentimes happens over time is that patients may sometimes acquire resistance to these drugs because they have mutations that prevent that covalent bond from, from actually happening. Uh, there are some new categories of BTK, what I call the second generation of brutinibs, and they don't require this chemical bond for its activity to manifest. These are actually very useful therapies, um, and they suppress the B cell receptor from giving the signals that can actually allow the B cell to proliferate and grow. But more importantly, they also inhibit the B cell's ability to migrate from the tissue into the blood and back into the tissues again. I liken it to being, uh, you know, we have a freeway I-5 here, or any type of freeway. If you were to drive your car on the freeway and suddenly you find there's no exit ramp, you just have to keep driving, uh, then eventually you will crash because of exhaustion. And that happens with B cells. Uh, and I think that these drugs are highly effective. And now six and going on seven-year follow-up studies, which are going to be released, show they are extremely effective in preventing progression of the disease, even in the uh, people who have very high-risk features. And uh, so, therefore, they represent a very important therapeutic uh, agent that we have for treatment. Unfortunately, most often, we cannot stop treatment. Uh, because what happens is that allows for uh, the leukemic cells to then go back into the microenvironment and then to regroup, if you will. And so, therefore, um, there is actually some concern as to whether this commits patients to lifelong therapy. And I've had some 
uh, investigators liken this to trying to treat hypertension or diabetes, that you can't cure it, but you just can treat it. But this you know, represents a cost. I subscribe to the notion that there's no treatment that doesn't have some side effects or downside. And it would be nice to use therapy and then be done with it if we can get to a point where we can get rid of the disease beyond a level that we can detect. And that comes into play with these inhibitors of this protein that I called the BCL2 family member proteins. They can actually cause the death of the cell. In fact, their major side effect is that they're so effective that when you use them in patients with a lot of leukemia cells, the leukemic cells can undergo cell death all, all at once. And the problem there is, of course, that could be quite toxic to the kidneys and to the heart and everything else. So you have to monitor that very carefully as you start therapy. But the good news is that many patients, over two thirds, after a year or more of therapy, may get into a, a complete response or a very good partial response where you cannot detect any leukemia cells in the body if you go look in the marrow or if you look in the blood and using very sensitive techniques that are able to detect one cell, perhaps in a million, you cannot detect any leukemia cells. Now, we have actually a consideration that patients may then be able to stop therapy at that point. And this is attractive for many people because, you know, why take therapy for years and years when after a year of therapy, I can be done with it and be free of the disease and perhaps not look back and go on with my life. And frankly, I can understand that I would probably feel the same way. And I think this is a very important thing that needs to be discussed with patients. Unfortunately, not all patients are the same, and not all CLLs are the same, too. In other words, we have to also figure in whether certain patients might be better suited for fixed duration therapy than other patients. And key among this is understanding the two types of leukemia that we have. We have uh, the type that uh, tends to evolve or develop from a more primitive B cell. And these B cells, they have changed their antibody genes, but they haven't undergone this process of mutation that I talked about in the development of the immune responses. And they express unmutated receptors, and they're derived from a more primitive B cell precursor. And patients who have leukemic cells, which account for about half of patients, with unmutated antibody genes tend to have a disease that progresses more quickly. We find that patients oftentimes require therapy within three to five years after diagnosis. Uh, and also after treatment, even apparently successful treatment with either multi-agent chemotherapy or even these inhibitors of BCL2, they may actually incur a relapse. Uh, of the disease, even if they have been able to eradicate the disease beyond its detection. On the other hand, there is another type of CLL where the leukemia cells express a mutated antibody gene, and these cells are derived from a more uh, differentiated B cell. And typically, patients who have leukemia cells with mutated antibody genes uh, typically may require therapy within five to nine years after diagnosis. And some patients may go on and not require therapy uh, for many years after diagnosis. And so this is important because past is prologue. When you enter into therapy, what you had before treatment oftentimes will play itself out after therapy. And so um, one of the aspects that we may have to consider is for patients who really have a potentially very indolent process uh, where the disease takes years to develop and after you get it down to a level where you cannot detect, it may not come back for many years after treatment, then a fixed duration therapy make, uh, makes a lot of sense uh, rather than have to stay on continuous therapy for years and years and years. Um, because the advantage there is that you are one and done with the treatment. On the other hand, some patients who have certain genetic features in addition to these unmutated antibody genes means that the tumor might be in overdrive. And if you get to a point where you eradicate the disease beyond its detection, it most likely will come back. And we've had some patients, for example, come back even after they have achieved undetectable minimal residual disease. Within two months, they can have a relapse if they have very aggressive disease. And this is kind of a shock. And I think we have to always remember 
Minimal residual disease should never be considered positive or negative because our limit of detection at the very best is one in a million. Well, if you think about it, everyone has over 10 to the 12th or a million million lymphocytes. So you can see that there's a lot of cells down there, even if you detect one in a million, that you won't be able to detect. And if there is a proclivity for the leukemic cells to advance rapidly, even though you've gotten it to a level of undetectability, then you can actually have the disease recur. And then you have to ask the question, does it make sense to undergo fixed duration therapy and then have to undergo repeat therapy within a few months or even a half year after completion of therapy? I think it is still something that uh, begs the question of how can we eradicate the clone altogether? How can we stop the disease? I actually am very optimistic that we can ultimately develop treatments that can eradicate even these more aggressive subtypes of CLL. But Unfortunately, what I see currently with the current very good therapies, targeted therapies, is we're not there yet to a point where we can conclude that we can eradicate the disease, at least in all patients. And so therefore, there's still a challenge. And right now I feel that we're in a great time. We have a lot of new drugs to treat patients. Patients are living longer. And I see many patients in my clinic that I know would have been dead by now. And actually, it's great. They're great people seeing their grandkids still at work and doing things that they think that are very productive. And it's gratifying for me as a physician to see that. And that's a testament to the fact that these new drugs having great activity. On the other hand, I also see the future in that what we would like to achieve is a fixed duration therapy where we can eradicate the disease at its roots and perhaps potentially keep it from recurring at all. And I think we can get there, but unfortunately more work needs to be done. And so we have to continue research efforts. I hope that there's still interest in, in funding additional research in, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, because I think the problems that we are facing with this leukemia are inherent in cancers in general. And how do we eradicate cancer, prevent it from recurring, prevent it from metastasizing, these are big challenges today. So we shouldn't become complacent. We should be able to go on and continue the work to develop new agents that might be transformative, even for patients who have these more aggressive features that make fixed duration therapy perhaps less attractive.